So hi everyone, uh, my name is Ali Dorani and I am a cartoonist. Uh, I am originally from Iran, 29 years old, and uh, I do a lot of political cartoons about, not about Iran, but about Australian government in Australia because uh, uh, I lived in Australia and Papua New Guinea for a couple of years in a prison. And today I'm going to tell you the story about uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what my drawings are about and why uh, I talk about Australia everywhere I go. And uh, first thing I would like to say thanks to uh, Ho Gamla uh, for inviting me here. And it's a pleasure to be here and talk to you about my story. So thank you very much. So the first I start from uh, Iran, when uh, the, the, the time that I left Iran. Uh, I was around 19 and 20 years old when I left my country. And uh, I don't usually talk about the reason why I left my country. Uh, but uh, I was in a bad situation. Uh, I didn't feel safe anymore and me being uh, back home in my country was making so much problem for my family. So the best uh, way to uh, give my family security and safety was me leaving Iran. And uh, the easiest way for me to get to a Western country where I get enough support as an Iranian political uh, person was uh, Australia. It was so easy for me to get to Australia. So in uh, 2013, uh, uh, I decided to go to Australia, uh, not uh, legal. So I had to find the smuggler and pay the smuggler uh, to take me to Australia. So I had to travel to Indonesia first and wait there uh, uh, until the smuggler tells me uh, what time, what date I should get on a boat to go to Australia. And uh, I stayed in Indonesia around 45 days uh, until uh, I got the chance to get to one of the boats uh, and go to Australia. It was horrible, like uh, the ocean was, uh, uh, the storm was there, a very, very bad storm. And we were around 130 people in one boat. Uh, uh, that we entered uh, the Australian borders shore. Uh, we got to an island which was called Christmas Island. That Christmas Island is one of the places where Australia used to keep uh, Im uh, illegal uh, refugees, illegal asylum seekers. Like the illegal means that uh, not entering Australia with airplane, for example, in a legal way. So. Uh, and also asylum seeker, if we could travel to Australia legally, then we wouldn't be called asylum seekers. So uh, uh, we, uh, that's uh, the, the, an international law that gives asylum seekers a law to, if they don't feel safe to enter to another country, uh, however they can, however it's possible. So in 2013, I arrived in Australia. And when I arrived in Australia, it was, five days after Australian government created the policy against refugees, against uh, the asylum seekers who are entering Australia by boats. And, uh, and I wasn't so lucky because while I was in Indonesia, I didn't have access to telephone, internet or TV to see what Australia was doing. Uh, so I was kept in a yeah, area without access to social media. So I had no idea that Australia is creating this policy. Uh, when I arrived there, uh, they uh, almost arrested me and others, but it wasn't like handcuffing. It was like they told us that we are under Australia's protection and uh, we will have to go through a process of immigration and, uh, until what happens in the future. I arrived in uh, Christmas Island Australian government uh, put me under their protection. Uh, and a Christmas Island was a camp uh, so much like a prison. So it was called a refugee camp, but it was a prison. 
and uh, so many people there, thousands of people there. And after a couple of uh, weeks, uh, the, the authorities came to us and they said, we are not allowed to stay in Australia anymore. And we are going to be sent to uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, where they had another offshore detention center out of Australia, where they, could, uh, they were able to keep uh, refugees there. I lived in Christmas Island for around six months. And I think I was almost the last person who was moved to Papua New Guinea. Uh, because after I arrived in Papua New Guinea, there, a crisis happened, like local people attacked inside the detention center, and suddenly the government stopped sending people to Papua New Guinea. So I was almost one of the last people entered Papua New Guinea. It's not so lucky. Uh, while I was in Christmas Island, I was uh, uh, sick. Uh, I already had OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. So this OCD was annoying me so much because I was in a place where I didn't have any control on, on uh, uh, the belongings around me and the people. So my OCD got really, really bad. And uh, that was the time I started drawing. And when I was moved to Papua New Guinea after six months, uh, I didn't have access to drawing materials anymore. We didn't have uh, uh, access to proper food, uh, proper uh, hygiene uh, places, uh, dirty toilets, dirty showers. And like uh, it, the place I lived, as you can see in the picture, it was just a few hundred square meters, with, uh, including f around 650 people in this few hundred square meters, where they kept us. And it looked so much like a zoo and where you keep monkeys. Uh, and animals, and uh, without ha having access to basic human rights, without having access to telephone, internet. So we were like uh, left behind uh, in a remote place in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And nobody knew, but I, wasn't, I didn't have any documents. So I, in, in uh, practical, I wasn't existing at all. Uh, no documents, and also my family did not know anything about me and what was happening to me. So. Uh, we were around 600 people living in this area. Uh, we, we had uh, like uh, same clothes, same colors. So it was like uh, the camp was all white, close to the ocean. And uh, we had same clothes, like uh, we were like 650 people and having only three colors of t-shirts between 650 people. So not uh, seeing colors was a lack of life, a lack, lack of human rights even. So not seeing different colors. Uh, and uh, uh, so yeah, when I uh, arrived in uh, this island, uh, they, the government authorities gave us uh, ID, ID cards. So there was this card uh, uh, which was called ID card. And my number, as you can see in the picture, was RUF-115. So RUF was the uh, military code on the name of the boat which I arrived in Australia with, which is Romo Uniform Foxtrot 115. Uh, so I was called as a military code for five years. And uh, even now, if somebody tries to joke with me and then call me RUF-115, I'm going to jump and look around to find that person who's calling me. And um, I think the last time such a thing happened in history was during World War II, calling uh, 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 prisoners uh, and uh, Jewish people as objects, giving them signs. They're just Jewish, they're not human. You know, so the, the, and Australia is doing it right now in this modern time to children and to families and to young people. Uh, I didn't have access to proper drawing material. Uh, and I remember I used to ask the government and authorities to give me paper and pencils. And I didn't have any uh, protest in mind. I just wanted to document my own life. And I'm not a good writer, I'm a good drawer. So I couldn't write and uh, uh, cop, uh, like keep my diary. So I had to uh, draw for myself. And uh, so I started drawing the situation of my life and other people's life in the detention center. Uh, 
asking the government give me materials they wouldn't give me, so I had to steal, steal uh, paper and pencil from the workers there, from the soldiers and the authorities. And uh, I, when I stole the papers from them, that doesn't mean I had a like, full blank paper. I had like a paper of documents, and there was a small space blank underneath the documents that I could draw and keep it for myself. And if you look at my drawings also, you see uh, most of my drawings are full of information in one page. And it's so confusing sometimes for people to understand them. And that's just because I didn't have access to paper. So I had to put as much as information in, in one page and uh, as much as uh, uh, daily life experience I had in the detention center in one page. So that's why most of my drawings are full of uh, information. Yeah, you see like in that drawing with the hands, that was one of the first drawings uh, that I was able to smuggle it out to Australia and publish it on the news and different places in Australia. And uh, so you see like I learned how to steal papers there. So I, I became a robber in detention center and I also became a smuggler, smuggling art to Australia. And if you, if, like what people know about Australia is like one of the most free countries in the world one of the most beautiful places in the world. But underneath, with the political immigration policies, Australia is one of the horrible countries in the world towards immigrants. And uh, even they make document, documentaries and show it on the news about how restricted is Australian airports when you want to enter the airports. And if you search just on the internet uh, about the documentaries that are about the Australian airports inside Australia, you'll find so many, so many different uh, uh, like uh, films that show the restrictions towards immigrants in Australia. And uh, so I, uh, this drawing was one of the first drawing that I was able to publish it in Australia. And uh, I drew so many uh, cartoons about uh, my life and the hunger strikes I had in the detention centers complaining about my situation. Also, uh, a lot of, like, of course, funny stories about the situation, but underneath these funny stories, it's like a horror. I remember we, this drawing is about a chicken following me and trying to, uh, like, make out with me. And uh, I drew this because I had an actual dream, nightmare, about a chicken following me, trying to find me. And the, I saw that dream because we were, uh, the, the food we had in the detention center for more than six months was chicken for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the same type of chicken, we used to call it zebra chicken because it had, like, it, it was supposed to be grilled chicken, but it wasn't, and it tasted horrible. So after a couple of months eating that, I had dreams about chickens following me. Of course, it's funny, but if you look at it as six months having the same type of food every day, uh, it's like uh, it's impossible to survive. So, and also uh, I used my ID card uh, in the detention center to, uh, to share some information about the sexual harassment and sexual abuse in the detention centers, which happened to me as well. And uh, of course, the government in Australia was not happy about them. Also, I did uh, a drawing. I remember I was on a hunger strike. That I did the drawing uh, that is called a scream, eating fish version. And uh, you see in this drawing that I have security cameras, palm trees, and the sun, and a lot of people in the background uh, uh, not visible, their faces not visible. And I did this drawing uh, uh, when I was in Hungary, so and I had no idea about Norway. I had no idea even the artist was Norwegian. I knew the painting, I have been hearing the name of the artist, but I didn't know uh, it, he was Norwegian. And then uh, suddenly the destiny uh, led me to come and live in Norway afterwards. So I uh, drew a lot of cartoons while I was in detention center until uh, I remember after a year and a half living in Manus Island in Papua New Guinea, the Australian government allowed us to have access to internet 45 minutes every week. And this uh, 45 minutes after a year and a half was like 
a world to me. Uh, and the internet was horrible. Like connecting to Facebook and just sending text, this was horrible. So it took like, uh, it used to take so much time for me just to type a text and send it out. But it was a good opportunity for me to connect to my Facebook account and send random, send a message to random people on Facebook. The people who I was guessing they live in Australia. And I used to write this message as that I am Ali Dorani, I'm a cartoonist living in detention center and I need help. And I sent these messages to thousands of people on Facebook without getting any reply. And I did that for over a year without anybody replying me. And uh, the interesting part was that I had only 45 minutes every week and the internet was also so bad. So I had to wait for one week, go back to the internet to see if anybody replied, losing hope so much time, so many times. And uh, if anybody replied or not, if nobody replied, then I continued texting to many other others. And I did that continuously for one week, one, over one year until I got a message from someone in Australia whose name was Janet Galbraith. And she was a poet. Uh, and she asked me about who I am and why I'm sending her these messages. And the process of me making her trust me that I was, I, I'm an actual person in detention center, it took months because uh, I used to go to the internet, 45 minutes, bad internet, replying to her message, to her question. She had so many questions. Replying to her question and going back to my room, uh, wait for one week and go back. And uh, she has another question. So I had to go back to the room and come back. And this took like months until she actually trusted trusted me as a person. So she uh, asked me if I can smuggle my drawings to Australia. And I did that and she started publishing them on the news and on the newspapers and also uh, leading uh, the uh, drawings to go to the Guardian News in Australia. And uh, that was when I got in touch with another cartoonist, Australian cartoonist, whose name was First Dog on the Moon. And he also helped me to publish the drawings. And all these publishments uh, led to uh, a campaign in Australia uh, where uh, hundreds of Australian artists, famous Australian artists, started drawing cartoons uh, in support of eating fish and publishing them on their social media. And that had so much attention internationally. Where, uh, also, an, a cartoon organization in the UK, which is called PCO, Pro Cartoonists Organization, uh, uh, started acting on this campaign and making it a huge campaign internationally. And the campaign was called Hashtag Eat and Fish. And on this campaign, PCO asked uh, artists around the world to draw cartoons in support of Italian fish and publish it on this hashtag or their, on their social media. And this hashtag had so much attention and it, it all came from these 45 minutes of internet accessing to social media. So a lot of people think negative about social media, it's bad, but sometimes it can be good as well. So it can save lives uh, at some points. And uh, so this campaign was also one of the largest cartooning campaigns in the world as well. I, I, some, I, I've been like hearing from here or there that uh, the cartooning campaign for Hashtag Eat and Fish was the second largest cartooning campaign after Charlie Hebdo uh, campaign. So it was a huge opportunity for me to share my story with the outside world from uh, an island in the Pacific Ocean. So these two pictures that you see, that's uh, Andrew Malton, First Dog on the Moon, the cartoonist from Guardian. Uh, and also she's uh, Janet Galbraith, the, the person who replied to my messages on Facebook and started publishing my drawings out. So this campaign came uh, to a situation in 2017 uh, where I was on a hunger strike and uh, I suddenly got a text from someone in Norway saying that uh, we are working on your case to get you out of there. And I was like, this email is just from someone to make me feel good. I actually didn't know it was from Norway. 
I was on a hunger strike, someone sends me a message. I've, I've been getting so many messages while I was on a hunger strike. Uh, and I, I had the hunger strike in 2017 in, uh, the, the, for the protest I had against the sexual harassment. And, uh, and the harassment I was getting from uh, the authorities. And uh, I remember I got this email from Norway. And uh, after a couple of months, Janet uh, told me that she is applying for this organization, which is called ICORN. Uh, and ICORN is going to help me to get out of my style. I was just thinking, ah, OK, this is one of the another nice message. People are kind. They want to help. But the, after uh, uh, a couple of months, it was just two or three months before I came to Norway that I got an email from a UDI, the immigration department in Norway. And they uh, told me that I'm welcome to Norway. So they sent me a visa and a passport to travel to Norway. And of course, the, travel of, uh, the process of me traveling from detention center to Norway was uh, another story. Uh, because I was in prison, I was really sick. And uh, I had to go to hospital, stay in hospital, until I was so much better, until I was able to travel. And uh, so then I came to Norway. Uh, I remember when I was in the uh, detention center uh, the, and got the, the welcoming email from UDI. I remember the people from ICORN, they were sending me pictures of Stavanger, showing me that where I'm going to come and live. And uh, it was very beautiful and sunny, green. And uh, I was thinking, oh, this place looks like heaven. And when I came to Stavanger, because I came right from jail without having like a the jacket or anything. So I came to Stavanger and it was so dark. It was the 17th of December, so dark and uh, cold, no green leaves on trees. And I actually, I actually got so scared because I was thinking, that all this process was a plan for Australian government to exile me to another place. And uh, so I was uh, so uh, shocked. But then after a couple of days, I got back to normal and uh, I started feeling safe. And I remember the first thing I did when I came to Stavanger was going out in the middle of the night without anybody following me, like without having a bodyguard or security following me and I was feeling so safe. Nobody was going to attack me. And uh, so I felt so good. And after I came to Norway, I started meeting my fellow cartoonist friends who helped the campaign to grow and uh, who helped me to get my freedom. So in that picture, you see like a, uh, we all reunited uh, together and took a picture and since when I came to Norway, I have been visiting uh, so many schools, going to different universities and festivals in and out of Norway, and sharing the stories uh, from the detention centers and what Australia is doing. And I, was, I had the opportunity to meet the uh, uh, crown prince and princess. And uh, I had a big opportunity to be part of the Norwegian uh, program for uh, last year's uh, book festival in Frankfurt. And I had a huge exhibition sharing my story with German people in Germany. I mean, not only German people, international, but uh, it was in Germany in Frankfurt and it was one of the biggest exhibitions I expected uh, from my work. And uh, so I visited many different schools uh, talking about the situation that Australia creates for people, innocent people, that they are looking for safety, but instead they are being in jail. Uh, also talking about how Australia is treating the children in these places. Like imagine, like I was called RUF 115 like an object for years. I, as an adult, that had a huge negative impact on me, uh, losing my self-confidence and thinking that I don't uh, deserve anything, I'm just I'm just this number. Uh, and Australia is doing the same thing to children 
in these detention centers. So some of these children, they were born in detention center, and now they are six, seven, eight years old. So, and they were grown up behind these fences and seeing themselves behind the fence, not having any experience of the normal life of a kid out of detention center and seeing their picture on the internet behind the fences with blurred uh, faces, seeing themselves on the internet and just what happens to these children if they get their freedom back, just imagine, you know. When, when I talk to Norwegian people about detention centers, usually they, they have the picture of Norwegian detention centers, Norwegian immigration centers, where people are free, they can go out, they can make friends. Some people can go study while they're in detention center. Some people get married, start a new life. Of course, they are still in immigration center, but they have the opportunity to meet and get help and support. But the Australian government is not like that. It's totally different. And with a little bit of search on the internet, you can see so many horrible stories. And if you just search hashtag hidden fish, it connects you to so many different stories from refugees and asylum seekers in Australia. And so I've been living in Norway for two years and a half now, almost three years. Uh, I am dating someone now. So hopefully that can lead to somewhere positive in the future. And for the future, I have some plans. I started uh, filmmaking and I would really like to uh, continue filmmaking because I remember when I was a child, I had two wishes in my life. One of them was uh, being a cartoonist. And I remember when I was 22 in detention center, all these cartoonists that I used to wish to be like them, all of them, they drew cartoons for me to support me. And that was such a, uh, it was from a horrible place, but it was such a huge uh, uh, pleasure seeing the people who I used to wish to be like them, this time drawing for me and recognizing me as a cartoonist and publishing me and calling me a cartoonist in the different news organizations around the world. That was one of my wishes which came true in a horrible situation. The second wish was being a filmmaker and uh, share more stories by uh, the films. So I'm working on that. And also I'm trying to write a book, a uh, comic biography book about my life uh, in detention center. And I hope uh, uh, I'll, be, I'll be able to be the voice of the voicelesses, especially the voiceless people in Australia and detention centers. Yeah. I can also tell about why I chose the name Eaton Fish. I tell also something about this picture actually, because uh, this picture is taken in England uh, where I had uh, a presentation or interview with uh, one of the BBC uh, uh, journalists. It was in Westminster Reference li Library, which used to be uh, Isaac Newton's house. And uh, I had this uh, uh, conversation there, and I went to England because uh, the campaign, Eat and Fish campaign, won an award uh, uh, from uh, uh, the organization called Index and Censorship uh, and uh, the campaign won an award and they invite me, invited me there to be uh, one of the guests and the organization uh, that was called PCO and CRNI, Cartoonist Rights Network International, uh, the, the two uh, uh, important organizations that helped the campaign to grow uh, they were there to accept the award, and so I went uh, there, and for the first time I met uh, the people who I didn't know who they were for five years. I only contacted them on email, and I didn't know them in person. The first time I met them, it was in England. Uh, also in this picture you see uh, that picture was taken a month before I came to Norway. And this is like a year after I came to Norway. 
And I remember on that picture, I was uh, around 45 kilogram. So I, I, ha I had uh, so much weight problem when I was there. And you can see the difference. Now I'm trying to find ways to lose weight. Yeah, I'm just uh, growing now. Uh, that was the last one. So a lot of people also ask me why I, what, where does the name come from, Eaten Fish? Why Eaten Fish? And uh, why hashtag Eaten? Why, why do you have this fishy name? I actually hate seafood. So I, that doesn't come from seafood. Uh, I chose Eaten Fish because when I was a child, I used to draw. And I used to read so many cartooning magazines and comic books. And I, if you read comic, comic books and cartoon, you see cartoons, you see every artist has uh, its own signature. Some people have their name, some people have the signature. Uh, when I was a child, I also chose a signature for myself, which was a fishbone. And I used to put it in my drawings. I didn't publish any of my drawings in Iran. I only had them for myself, and I had the signature just pretending that I'm a cartoonist and I have my own signature, and it was a fishbone. Uh, when I went uh, to Australia and then I was published, uh, I remember my cartoonist from, friend from Guardian, he told me, Ali, now that you're being published, you need to have a signature, you need to have an artistic name. Because when we publish your drawing and call you Ali on the news, People can't recognize which alley we are talking about. There are thousands of millions of alleys around the world. So you need to have your own name so people can recognize you. And then I wanted to make a name connected to my childhood wish and connected to my situation. So I chose Eaten Fish, which means fish bones. And the story behind it is that when I went to Australia, I went with a fishing boat. And what happened was Australian government caught me from the sea, like when you go catching fish. And then they uh, put me in a detention center for process. That means while you're eating a fish, the fish that you caught, eating it, and then after you eat the fish, what do you do? You put it in a rubbish bin, uh, because it's just bones and you don't need it anymore. And after the processing Australia did, they throw me to another country in exile which felt like a rubbish bin for me. And the name Eaten Fish also comes from that. Yeah, so a lot of people ask, and this is the story behind the name Eaten Fish, yeah.